I hope you can hear me. A very warm welcome from Victoria here and a welcome to this webinar on Brexit, Borders and Division for Europe. I hope you can hear me. We, you can communicate with a chat box up there. That will be also the medium to use when you raise questions after the presentation. Um, and let me just put this a little bit into context. You know, this webinar is part of a series on global politics and critical perspectives that we have the pleasure of organizing here at the Center for Global Studies. My name is Oliver Schmidtke, and I'm directing the director of the, the Center for Global Studies here at UVic. And we've been partnering with the European Union in a project that allows us to put on these webinars that are meant to engage the broader public with issues that are of broad public concern. And I hope you agree that Brexit is on everybody's minds at the moment, in particular after what we've seen um, lately uh, in uh, involving in London. Um, so just a, a quick note for those of you who participate, uh, you'll be able to listen to us and you know um, participate with the chat box. Uh, you won't be able to um, speak uh, via audio. That would create too much chatter. So I hope we can keep it manageable by having us three here presenting and then you participating through the chat box. Also, a quick heads up that this session will be recorded and made available for later uh, consumption. So let me uh, briefly introduce our session today. And I think you know we couldn't have timed this any better considering the vote yesterday um, on the Brexit deals that so miserably failed uh, for Prime Minister May. Uh, not too surprising. And you know I think we're not even clear where the Brexit negotiations will go if when and how the Brexit will come about. So there's no clarity about this, but I think we do have some clarity looking back, considering what this has done to politics and you know, the division within the United Kingdom. Uh, the Brexit debate has kept the political imagination on the, uh, in the UK for the past year, you know, more dramatically over the past couple of weeks. And we can already see, you know, it will have a huge implication for, let's say, the, the role of the executive and parliament, the division of parties, if you look at in particular the Tories, how they divide, how divided they are over the issue, but also the Labour Party. You can only imagine what this will mean for long term in terms of the long term implications and to deal with the possibility of a hard Brexit or whatever shape it's gonna take. So that might be part of our discussion today, but you know, our idea was also taking advantage of the expertise of our speakers to look at a slightly different um, angle. And uh, I, th I think you would agree with me, you know, taking a step back from the immediate political debate, that Brexit is essentially about legitimate forms of borders and the very nature of the political community in which we live. Um, in many respects, the plea to, as it was called, to take the country back, to win back sovereignty, uh, was essentially about the borders of the UK and the control over these borders. And the Brexiteers uh, clearly challenged uh, some of the fundamental principles on which the European Union is built, and you know, most prominently the four uh, fundamental freedoms that were ratified in the Roman Treaty that are committed to the free flow of people, goods, services across borders. And you know, to, to, to state that we need to rethink this basic principle um, clearly introduces a new way of looking at borders and legitimate borders on the European continent. And um, what we see here is how the talk about borders, sovereignty, um, control over things, is a very powerful rhetorical tool in politics, but yet when it comes to establishing this in practice, to reintroduce borders, it is a very complex and complicated issue as we see at the moment. And you know, one issue that has become the sticking point in much of the Brexit deal at the moment is the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. You know, probably who would have thought before this all started that this would become the central issue and sticking point in the negotiations. It just shows you how controversial and difficult it is now to reestablish borders in the 21st century when our economies are deeply integrated, when cross-border mobility has become something that we are used to, and 
if you do this in a context where there is a history and legacy of fierce debate about this border, the division between uh, religious uh, groups, then you have a real issue at your hand. And this is what we've seen to play out very forcefully, what the status of the Irish border is in terms of dividing uh, the island, the, the economic repercussions. Um, so I'm very pleased um, that we have two eminent scholars and well-renowned scholars who have worked a long time on those kind of issues to look at, take a look at Brexit through the lens of border regimes and border politics in this respect. And you see already on the screen, um, uh, I can now welcome uh, our two speakers, Katie Hayward from Queen's University Belfast and Emmanuel Brunet-Jaï from the University of Victoria. And I'm going to introduce them a slightly bit more fully when uh, I, I invite them to present here. And today we're going to start uh, with Katie Hayward, uh, who is a reader in sociology in Queen's University of Belfast. And she has worked uh, for a long period on the EU and the Irish border, uh, both in terms of her scholarly work, you know, most recently, you know, with book publications and a long report on the EU and border conflict, but also as a policy analyst and expert, both advising uh, key players um, in the political arena, but also the broader public. Katie, if I'm not mistaken, you've been quite prominent out there in the public arena also with your commentary on what is happening in terms of border politics. You can see here uh, the prominent positions she has held and you know the, the major contribution Katie Hayward has made to the debate of borders uh, in Ireland and the broader context of European integration. So Katie, if I might invite you to start your presentation, you can control your uh, your PowerPoint with the arrows on the left uh, side in you know, the corner there. And I'm going to mute my microphone now and uh, leave the floor, the virtual floor, to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, sorry, that was my <laughs> Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, and hello, Manuel, and hello to everybody who's watching. Um, this is my first time doing a webinar, so please bear with me. Um, I should um, pay credit to the Borders and Globalization Project um, because the timing of that project has been perfect in terms of looking again at the Irish border. When the project began, of course, we were looking at the Irish border as a very um, um, uh, wonderful example, actually, of integration and cooperation across the border. Um, most particularly so because the border has a history of um, uh, troubles and violence. Um, and of course, in the sh few short years since that point, um, a lot of people have become interested in the Irish border, and in particular in the importance of, the e of EU membership of both the UK and Ireland to transforming that border. So what I would, wanted to do in this um, presentation, and I will try and keep to time, is just to try and explain why the Irish border is quite so critical to the Brexit process and um, the key concerns in relation to it, so how it's been approached, and then why it is that um, uh, that it has been uh, uh, presented in such a way from the EU Irish side and then also from the UK side as being absolutely critical to Brexit. Uh, Oliver mentioned the phrase taking back control, which is very prominent in the Leave campaign um, in the UK referendum on the 23rd of uh, June 2016. And Nigel Farage, pictured here, who um, is an MEP, uh, played a leading role in that Leave campaign. And it's worth noting that a lot of the momentum behind the Leave campaign was uh, connected to the idea of sovereignty and also to uh, border control, most particularly concentrating on immigration in particular. Um, and as a result of that, very quickly after the, um, after the referendum uh, took place, the, Irish gov the UK government was very clear that it wanted to um, continue to be uh, absolutely firm in relation to immigration. Uh, so the taking back control mantra persisted. And in response to this, the EU was very clear, and it said uh, the four freedoms of movement in the EU are um, are absolutely inseparable. And so if we have the freedom of movement of people, 
Uh, if you want to stop that, then it also means um, uh, that you can't be part of a single market anymore. So this immediately placed a challenge for the Irish border, which meant that we, we have a difficulty then after Brexit in keeping the Irish border as open as it is for all the other freedoms as well. Just to try and explain the Irish border in just one graphic, um, um, so essentially the border is about 500 kilometres um, long. It has a contentious history. It's 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 been um, the subject of uh, uh, for a long period a, a dispute between uh, the UK and the um, Republic of Ireland, um, and uh, has been uh, highly symbolic in um, the. Uh, the campaign of the um, Irish Republican uh, movement for independence from the UK entirely. Um, this particular graph, graphic here um, contrasts the number of crossing points that exist on the EU's external border, particularly on the eastern border, um, which we know is um, strictly maintained, compared to the crossing points on the Irish border. And there's some discussion, ongoing discussion, about how many crossing points there are, but essentially the point is that um, the border comes in a very rural area, and there are many informal crossings that are very difficult to um, maintain control of. During the Troubles, uh, so that was the, the period of violence for about 30 years in 1968-69, um, the border became a very hard border and a securitized border. And so a big part of controlling the border entailed shutting down many of those crossing points. Um, and you can see there that the number um, that remained open during the Troubles was right down to 20. Nowadays, in the context of the, of, uh, the single market, uh, joint single market membership of the UK and Ireland, um, there's been a flourishing of um, economic development in the border region, which was traditionally underdeveloped. Uh, you can see the figures there. And in terms of people movement, there's about 110 million um, movements of people across the border every year. So to get straight down to business, what has the EU done to transform the Irish border? Um, well, above all else, it's done something that's actually quite difficult to, to quantify um, and to summarize clearly. But actually, it's been the, the context of EU membership that has made the biggest difference, uh, because that EU membership has transformed the relationship between the two states on either side, so the UK and Ireland. Most particularly, what EU membership has done has mean that um, the border is no longer um, uh, the crossing the border is depoliticized. So to cross the border is not something that's politically significant or contentious anymore. Uh, so the normalization of cross-border cooperation across the EU has been um, really important for making uh, it uh, normal and uncontentious um, along the Irish border in particular and between the UK and Ireland more, more broadly. But of course, EU membership is not just about uh, making cross-border cooperation more normal and usual. It's also about practical measures to do so. Uh, so in terms of trade, the Irish border used to be a customs border until the, uh, the completion of the, the customs union within the EU. And so as part of the single market as well, um, since the early 90s, we've seen now the removal of customs posts, removal of tariffs on movements of goods across the border, and then, of course, all other forms of um, barriers to trade that exist in relation to that. Um, the creation of the harmonized regulatory system and the regulatory space that the UK and Ireland share as a result of EU membership uh, this is one of the reasons why we have such an issue in relation to how to manage Brexit, because immediately uh, the border will have, um, after Brexit, um, uh, would have not just sig uh, significance in terms of being a customs border, but also in terms of being a border in terms of regulatory difference. It will divide to regulatory spaces instead of uh, joining them. Um, also, the EU has transformed the Irish border in very meaningful ways for um, uh, citizens on both sides of the border. Uh, this is seen through the um, development of the EU in uh, enhancing EU citizens' rights, not just in terms of freedom of movement, but other um, uh, schemes such as the Treatment Abroad Scheme, which has uh, had benefits um, on both sides of the border. And then, of course, it's brought particular protections for frontier workers. And this happens um, 
in many cases, and these are the people who are most concerned about the Irish border, so people who live on one side of the border and work on the other. And the number of frontier workers that exist has, has um, greatly increased um, over the course of the past 20 years in relation to the peace process. And all this has happened in the context of ever closer union within the EU, so a lot of the um, uh, uh, the benefits or the the, um, the measures that the EU has supported in terms of developing border regions has really had a direct impact on uh, the Irish border region in particular. One element also in this, of course, is the EU as a as a, um, a zone for cooperation between in criminal justice and security, justice and home affairs, and this has had a particular benefit in terms of enabling police. Uh, cooperation across the Irish border, and again, making that less um, politically sensitive and more practically uh, beneficial. This too is uh, a big issue of concern in relation to Brexit. So, let's have a quick look at um, what is uh, how it came to be that the Irish border was brought to the heart of the Brexit process. Well, after the UK triggered Article 50 in um, in uh, February 2017, the EU came back with its uh, guidelines of the European Council negotiating guidelines, and it put up there three priorities. One was citizenships um, for the UK and, and EU citizens after Brexit. Uh, the other thing was the divorce bill, what the UK owed the EU, and then the third thing was the Irish border and Northern Ireland. And this was largely because the Irish government in particular had explained to the EU quite clearly its concerns in relation to how to maintain the openness of the Irish border after Brexit, bearing in mind its symbolic importance in the peace process. So the most uh, the significant progress that we had at the end of 2017 came with the joint report, which was after a lot of um, uh, disagreement and, and uh, um, ambiguity and uncertainty around what was going to happen for Ireland and Northern Ireland. So the joint report set out priorities for the withdrawal agreement, and this, when it came to Ireland and Northern Ireland, had two key priorities. The first was to avoid a hard border, including physical infrastructure and related checks and controls. And this graph, and I apologize for its complexity, but it's to try and explain why it is that this is actually quite a complicated issue. So it's not just about the movement of goods between Northern Ireland, which is a very small region, and Ireland um, back and forth, but it's also about trying to manage movement that comes from elsewhere uh, across the United Kingdom and then, of course, from outside Ireland and the UK. And these goods... Um, can be traveling into the EU and, 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 and into the single market, therefore, and of course, wider into and from third countries. So this is why um, trying to avoid a hard border and avoid checks and controls is actually quite complicated because it's involving goods that are coming from all sorts of places. And you can see here when the, thing, when the EU and the UK are concerned about what might be a risk if we have an open border after Brexit, it, it really is about goods that are coming in that they have that um, uh, that wouldn't have been subject to uh, their controls um, at, before they crossed the Irish border. Um, so this is the this is quite how complicated it is when we're talking about the Irish border and and managing to avoid um, uh, physical infrastructure checks and controls at that border after Brexit. The second priority was to protect the 98 Belfast Good Friday Agreement, um, and this includes the North-South implementation bodies and North-South cooperation that has developed uh, over the last 20 years uh, from a background of um, so-called back-to-back development where uh, there's been very little cooperation beforehand because it was simply very difficult to have such cooperation in the context of hard securitized border. Um, I will try and summarize the uh, Good Friday Agreement as quickly as possible. There are key, three key features uh, when it comes to uh, that are very particularly important when it comes to Brexit. So the first is that um, it recognizes um, that people who are born in Northern Ireland can be British, Irish, or both. Now this is really unusual, of course, because it means that there are people in Northern Ireland who are Irish citizens who hold Irish passports who do not consider themselves to be British or to have. They don't have, uh, to have British citizenship or to hold British identities. Um, and, and this is 
part of the reason why Northern Ireland is so unique within the United Kingdom. The second element of the agreement is those three strands um, for power sharing within Northern Ireland, cooperation across the island, and then British-Irish cooperation. And this is very practical um, output in terms of bodies that are meant to facilitate such cooperation. So safe food being one example where food safety um, has been worked out now on an all-island basis through close cooperation, north-south. Um, and we immediately know, of course, that food safety is a priority too for the single market and why they wouldn't want, uh, why the EU members are worried about um, ensuring that the uh, standards of uh, food products that may be coming from the island of Ireland will continue to meet those of the rest of the single market. And then another unusual um, feature of the Good Friday Agreement was that it allows for a border poll. So for a majority of people in Northern Ireland and in the South, vote to have a united Ireland, um, then uh, the UK would permit that to go ahead and there would be a united Ireland. Why this is important for Brexit is, of course, that in theory, Northern Ireland may well be able to vote um, in at some point in the future to become and uh, to return to the European Union. So this is what the UK and the EU have agreed upon to avoid a hard border and protect the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and basically they've been very keen to underline the fact that they must be upheld in all circumstances. And we know that what's been agreed at the moment from between the UK and the EU is just about withdrawal, it's just about the UK's exit. We still don't know the future UK-EU um, agreements and future treaties that will take place. Um, and this is why we have the so-called backstop. The backstop in the withdrawal agreement is the insurance policy uh, that has been designed to try and make sure that a hard border is avoided in the future and the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is protected in the future. Uh, just to quickly outline what it is we anticipate happening if we're looking at the withdrawal agreement uh, that we uh, saw published in November. So, in principle or in theory, uh, the UK withdraws on the 29th of, of March. Um, then we have, according to the withdrawal agreement, if this is approved, a, a transition period um, that could possibly uh, be extended beyond uh, 31st of December if the UK wishes it to be so. Um, at the same time, then, we have the negotiations on the future relationship. Um, and we've seen the political declaration so far that um, the UK is really apparently aiming for a sort of Canada Plus model, so-called a free trade area, but maintaining very close relationship in terms of security. If it wishes to, the UK could ask for an extension to the transition period. If we, at the end of that time we don't have a future relationship agreed between the UK and the EU that manages to avoid a hard border and protect the agreement, then this is when the backstop comes into play. And putting it most simply, we have particular arrangements in Northern Ireland that see it in effect remaining part of the single market for certain goods and products um, that are seen as necessary to avoiding a hard border. And in addition to that, the UK will be part of a single customs territory with the EU. Um, now, I'm going to just skip over this uh, slide because it's uh, been made redundant, actually, by what happened yesterday. Uh, so, Theresa May, um, as we saw yesterday, um, failed to get her withdrawal agreement through uh, the, uh, Euro the UK Parliament, and I'm sure we'll discuss that in the question time. Just one thing I want to uh, mention before uh, concluding this is just the importance of uh, all these negotiations and these uh, discussions for uh, people living in Northern Ireland, Ireland, and most particularly in the border region. So some of the work I've done recently in the Irish border region with the Irish Central Border Area Network has been to try and understand what an open border means for people's lives. And there are many examples of um, uh, people's social lives, family life, uh, work life, um, uh, leisure activities, etc. All of this is very much happening on a cross-border basis for many people. And so they envisage the hardening of the border or any regression of, of that openness as simply affecting them in a very negative way. Um, and of course we have the connection between the 
the peace process and the open border. Many people in the border region are already seeing an impact from Brexit on their lives and plans. And to put this most simply, what it means is that it's making people more wary about having a, a cross-border um, existence, if you like. So the tendency now is to stick them to one side of the border or the other if you're thinking about future plans for your business or for study and the like. And these are some quotations to conclude on from the, the study in relation to um, what the border means. So people talk about the psychological impact of Brexit. It's basically reawakening people's sense of what the border means, and most particularly in terms of difference between Britain and Ireland. Many talk about how a hard border causing um, growing difference between unionists and nationalists within Northern Ireland. And again, they're concerned about the stability of the peace process as a result of that. Um, and then, of course, we have the practical effects of what border um, controls and checks would mean. And I like this quote to conclude on that um, one person, one respondent to, to one of the surveys we conducted said, actually, after 10 years of working together, we see what li life is like for normal people um, now in the border region, and we don't want to lose that. Um, and people are um, confused and concerned just so as many people are when it comes to the topic of Brexit. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. I think that was a very powerful account of what the multidimensional um, importance of borders is, in the, even in the 21st century. And in a way, what we have accustomed to, in particular in the European context, in terms of open borders, we, we often take it things for granted, uh, particularly for me with a longer history, you think about you know, the, the Iron Curtain dividing the continent, all this seems to have withered away and we might see a turn in terms of a reintroduction of harder borders, but that it is such a sticky issue in the very Brexit debate that we're addressing here um, speaks to you know, how divisive this issue can be and how difficult it is to reintroduce hard borders in a context in which you have this flow of people, of, um, of goods, of services across borders. And, and that really, you know, you, you might think, why is the Irish border so important? But I think, Katie, you, you've really highlighted how this has very you know, profound effects of, you know, on the, in the political history and political rea reality in Ireland, on economic ties and so forth. So thank you very much for this. And we now come to our two, next speaker, you know, who's ideally positioned to uh, help us in the discussion and understanding of the borders. Dr. Manuel Brunijai is a professor in Jean Monnet chair here at the University of Victoria in Innovative Governments at the School of Public Administration. And he's also directing uh, the European Union Jean Monnet Center here and the Jean Monnet Network uh, that we have here. And you, you might recall from Katie in her introduction that um, Emmanuel is also the lead of a seven-year partnership grant called Borders and Globalization, the big project, which looks at very different dimensions of borders. And Katie is uh, one of our partners and, and Emmanuel's partners in the European context. And as you can see from the slide, Emmanuel is also um, very much a scholar who has um, an enormous competence and experience in straddling the world of academic research and the policy community. And he has done a lot of consultancy work and, and provide expertise for different policy communities, partly through the big project. So, um, Emmanuel, if I could ask you to unmute your mic and uh, start your presentation, and the floor is all yours, and uh, welcome also. Is it working? Wonderful. Can you hear me? So, I think my talk is complementary to what uh, uh, Katie just uh, uh, explained, but I'm focusing a little bit more on issues of cost. And uh, the reason I'm doing this is that uh, I had a number of colleagues, but also you know public and elected officials who said, well, the UK, you know, they want to leave because the EU is really costly. It's very expensive to be a member of the EU for the UK. Um, and so the idea that I had in collecting the data and I'm preparing writing uh, papers on this is that, well, is there a real benefit that is measurable that we can assess the cost uh, when you leave 
the European Union, you're leaving a number of things, as Katie just explained, it's quite complex. It's actually extremely complex for Northern Ireland and for the Republic of Ireland in their future relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom, but also with Europe. And so um, this is kind of uh, the beginning of the idea that I had. And um, one of the first idea that I had was to make sure that what was discussed during the campaign, the pro, you know, Brexit and the ones who were opposed to leaving the EU had their number rights. And one of the things that I was uh, quite surprised uh, by, but I thought was really interesting, was that people were actually trying to say, well, you know, these, these are the big issue, it's expensive. And I tried to understand this. So there were a number of um, things that were said in the campaign that had to do with the millions of euros that had to be paid or the millions of pounds that had to be paid by the UK and how the UK would be able to obviously save that money from paying and reinvest, for instance, in health or public services. But of course, at one point, it was really discussed that it would go back into the health services. Um, and uh, and these numbers obviously were contested, and the numbers that um, we have um, on both sides are actually quite far apart. So, you know, in billions of um, pounds or billions of, of euros, um, most of my slides are actually about euros and less than half pounds uh, indicated. And uh, so, what we see here is basically a gap of a, about 100 million euros uh, per week um, between the two sides. And um, so I thought, okay, this is a really interesting start because what we see is that, um, interestingly, the UK is the only member state within the European Union that benefits from a rebate. No other member states actually get a rebate. And the rebate was negotiated by Margaret Thatcher uh, on the basis that, you know, the UK had all these issues um, in Scotland and in Wales and in Northern England and in Northern Ireland because it was a country that was basically redeveloping its industrial base and had a number of um, areas of its in, like the textile industry and the mining industry that were struggling. And so the debate is an interesting uh, number sometimes difficult to estimate but it's an interesting number because when we see uh, the big picture, obviously, it would be um, a few billion a year. And there again, uh, you have here on the, um, a, a brief pre presentation, and I have numbers that are going to follow, where basically we see how much the UK pays theoretically and how much the UK should actually benefit um, from the rebates. And so what's the exact number that is being paid? I'm going to detail this. And then one of the things that a lot of the debate forgot to include is the fact that the European Union actually returns some of the money. So you pay in because you're a member, you have a rebate if you are the UK and you're the only one. And then the EU programs that are actually spending money across the United Kingdom. And so I wanted to see if we basically add up all of these numbers, what would happen? And so some of the approximations that I had, and I have to be honest, one of the things that I found was particularly interesting is that I could not find any given year the exact same figure, whether it was in the EU or the, EU, or, or the UK, but, but, and that's really important, the proportion of the numbers are fairly similar. In other words, we're not very far apart, and it's accounting that may vary a little bit between UK government um, offices and the EU uh, European Commission with their own numbers. One of the ways to look at this, though, is to say, well, the UK contribution, as I put here, you know, is about, well, we can add 15, you know, plus uh, three, we're almost 18, 19 billion. And then there is the rebate, the UK rebate at uh, 5.8 billion. And so basically the contribution is about 12. To understand this carefully, we basically have to memorize that that's the number the UK paid every year. And it explained a lot of the fight over overpaying because 
when we look at what the UK receives from the EU every year, it only receives about 7 billion. So there is a gap of five. So my rationale is very simple. He is paying 5 billion a year worth the partnership. There is a solidarity affair here that is very important. And the idea that the European Union has a budget that organizes solidarity across all of the member states. So that certain states like Germany and France and even Italy and Spain and obviously the UK, but all the Scandinavian states, you know, Denmark and uh, Sweden pay more into the EU budget than they receive every year. And the UK has always contested this. Some of the editorials that we see in the media, whether it's in the Telegraph or the Guardian, have made it very clear that they disagree on why paying into the membership is worth it or not. The Guardian very often defends the idea that, you know, it's this part of the solidarity effort. The Telegraph very often attacks the fact that its money is swindled into the EU and that the peace efforts, which is, you know, at the origin of the creation of the European Union, is not relevant to UK politics today, has never really been. So, however, it's interesting, as I note on that slide, that, you know, there is a return. Some of the money comes back into the UK, but there is a gap. And it's about, as I say, if we look at the two slides that I have here, 12.7 billion versus seven, it's about a gap of 5.7 billion a year. So is it worth it? And this is where, you know, I'm going to talk to you about borders. So I have another estimate here, which I actually picked up from our UK parliamentary report, which, and you can see the figures are about the same. Um, we are closer to 13 instead of 12.7, we're at 13 billion pounds, and then it's for the rebate, it's four instead of being, and so on and so forth. So it's, the idea is just to, to remember with this. Um, and I summarize it with this slide. So you get a sense that there is a cost and that that cost is real. And that we can estimate that cost at about between five and six billion pounds or euros, depending where we look at it. And yes, there is an exchange rate, but the point is we can estimate it and we have a sense that it exists. So the whole issue is then, and it's a second question, I'll answer them afterwards one by one, but the whole issue is, you know, um, is the UK economy really benefiting from all of this? And why is it that it has to pay? Well, it pays into the EU budget on a yearly basis because it's a very large economy. And a number of people have said it's a very large economy. The effort of solidarity, as I said, is not justified towards other EU member states. And um, also, um, the fact that the UK will leave uh, the European Union um, should play in its favor because there will be a huge impact onto the EU economy, the European Union economy and a number of member states. And here what I find is that, you know, we, we realize that actually um, the the um, impact uh, is fairly small because the EU budget is fairly large. And so in when we look at, when we look at um, the relationship between uh, what the other member states of the EU contribute and therefore what they would have to contribute in addition to make up for the loss of the European, for the loss of the uh, United Kingdom as a member, is actually fairly small. And we can see here that a number of countries actually are benefiting from this. The Netherlands is one of them, and I can't really point to it, but the, man, the, the, the PowerPoint will obviously be on the webinar, so you could take a picture and look at it. Um, small countries actually benefit from this because it reorganizes, it reshuffles, if you want, contributions across all of the member states. So instead of 28, we have 27, and two member states, one of which is the Netherlands, the other one I think is Denmark, are both benefiting from the fact that the UK will disappear and other members have to pick up basically the slate. The two members that have 
to contribute more are Germany and France. And so what we find out here is that really, you know, the impact on the EU budget is going to be fairly small. And the impact on the EU economy is really a relationship between um, Euro Europe or the European Union, the rest of the world as a trade partner and the UK as well. And so the, 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 the new agreement, for instance, a clean Brexit versus no clean Brexit will have a tremendous impact on that, on that um, equation. Uh, one of the things that we discover here, for instance, is that the UK would have to pay custom to trade with the, U with the European Union, custom fees, and I'm going to get into this because it's the re-implementation of very specific border functions, right? And so I want to summarize here at this point and then go on. One of the things we've learned from the beginning of my presentation is that one, the UK does pay into the European Union membership about five to six billion a year. And it has received um, about seven billion, but the net, the net um, gap basically is about five billion. So it's a net payer. And the idea I have is, is Brexit going to cost more? So here on this slide, we discover that if you don't have a clean Brexit, well, it's almost the same figure. The World Trade Organization, I have WTA rule, if you, if you basically average the tariff at 2%, the UK, um, you know, will have to pay 4.6 billion a year to trade with the European Union. And so the difference now is about 1 billion. So the UK as a contributor will only really save 1 billion if it goes back to World Trade Organization rules. But there is the cost of Brexit. There is the cost of re-implementing borders. There is a cost and the risks that are, for instance, placed on Northern Ireland, political stability, economic stability, and also the risks of, um, in a way, implementing same difficulties between the other islands, England, Wales, and Scotland, and the rest of the European Union, which I'm going to discuss very briefly now. So economic difficulties with regard to Northern Ireland, and just want to talk very briefly about this because Katie went through, um, you know, broadly but the fact that the European Union contributes to the peace efforts and contributes has specific programs for cross-border regions, members of the European Union, but also sometime at the periphery of the European Union, has had a tremendous impact on Northern Ireland, a positive impact. For instance, today, uh, the agricultural sector gets a fairly significant subsidy on a yearly basis. Um, 80 cent, 87 pence to a pound uh, is the subsidy that Northern Ireland gets for all agricultural products that are basically sold into the EU. In other words, that sector would not be able uh, to function properly if it didn't get that kind of support, and so on and so forth. But I just wanted to highlight this. I am very briefly here, you have a presentation of the amount of money the European Union has invested through different programs. One is called PEACE, another one is called Interreg, Interregion Programs. These are the old cross-border programs. And you see that the cap, it's the bottom line cap, pillar one, is 2.299 million, so 2 billion point 299 million um, in agriculture. So we can see that the EU has had a positive impact on the economy of uh, that of, of Northern Ireland and a significant impact uh, contributing. Another thing that we, we realize is that, I'm, so I'm gonna pass on some of the slides that I have here because um, Katie has discussed them. So one of the things that we are dis discovering in a way is that there is a real cost 
to re-implementing borders. Um, and Kate, Katie has discussed some of them, but let me highlight some numbers here that, in a way, um, you know, contradict, but also raise red flags with regard to the ability the UK would have to have a no deal uh, with a peace of mind. Um, or, if, or even that the Brexit deal is actually a difficult deal for the UK and the rest of the, of the EU. Um, so one of the things that, for instance, really surprised me is that um, most of the custom declarations that accompany all trade flows between the UK and the European Union are not dealt with inside the UK today. They're dealt with on the continent, um, where, you know, even though the UK deals with about 50 to 55 million of those. We're talking about 255 to 260 million of basically trade slips that have to be cleared every year. The UK today doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have the human resource, but doesn't have the technology to deal with 200 million more um, custom slips. Yet, the impact onto the UK um, um, Treasury is about 40 billion a year. And when we look at other things than just the custom slips, if we look at, for instance, issues that have to do with human resource, um, the estimates from UK Parliament, but which I also found into EU documents, is that there is a gap about three to 5,000 staff missing in the UK to basically re-implement at the same level of standards the custom for the islands um, outside of the European Union. Because you see, one of the things that we discover when we have these two numbers is that they were hidden, in a way, economies of scales to the UK economy when 200 million custom slips are basically dealt with by agencies on the continent outside of the UK. And this goes along with staffing economies of scales, because obviously the staffing exists in the European Union on behalf of the UK traders. So these two numbers really highlight, you know, I guess, quite brightly, because they are large numbers, 50, a capacity of 55 million to, to trade slip to 260 million that, are, that doesn't exist. And staffing, currently the UK custom, and I forgot to say this, are staffing, the number that I have here is 7,734. 7, and today the estimates is that it would really need between 11 and 13,000 people to basically re-implement custom efficiently across the islands. So we have, we have a number of issues here that are very salient and have never been part of the discussion that really, in a way, diminish the idea that the UK was paying too much into the EU without a Brexit trade, without a Brexit or without an agreement, the cost of trading with the rest of the EU is 4.6 billion, and the cost of being a member, as I said, is between around 5 billion a year. The difference is 400 million. And then suddenly we realize that on custom issues, we have capacity and staffing issues. And then on top of this, and that's my final point. Um, the UK would have to redevelop infrastructures, modernize airports and seaports, and deep sea seaports are very expensive. And UK Parliament estimates on this, I have the, the picture here, is basically a cost between 19 and 26 billion. So, in other words, it would take at least five or six years 
of full payments. But you know, if we actually look at the worst possible trade agreement, cost 4.6 and membership at five, it could take a generation for the UK to just pay for new custom capacity um, or to stay into the EU would be the cheapest solution. And that's my last point today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel, for this rather sobering look at the real numbers and costs involved in re-establishing borders uh, in the UK. You know, the, the immediate question you know, that your presentation begs is, you know, how come some of those debates haven't been part of the public discussion about you know, the real costs? Uh, I think by now the, the, the threat of hard Brexit looms or the no-deal Brexit. I think there is some sobering realization of what the UK might have to face in terms of cost, of economic repercussions. But it is telling in a way that it hasn't been really, to any great detail, been part of the debate leading up to the situation right now. And you know, think about uh, another border debate at the moment at the southern uh, border of the United States. You know, the wall is, you know, there is a rational argument about cost and what it does. But clearly, borders also have this strong notion of a symbolic divide of, you know, instilling sovereignty. And so, in a way, they're crucial, in particular, to populist forces trying to reignite the sense, you know, we need to protect ourselves, you know, make ourselves great again, and so forth. So, it is, you know, it is interesting to see that you, know, you would expect, you know, the, the British in particular to come up with hard numbers and the economic repercussions, but we haven't seen much in this respect. Maybe, Manuel, you can uh, address this in a second, but I think the first uh, question came to you, Katie, and you know, this uh, speaks to the broader uh, context of uh, border regimes. Uh, Rotterbell here from the Center for Global Studies asked, um, pr Brexit pressures create opportunities to unify Ireland within EU, EU, and would it create an opportunity to actually eliminate the Irish border altogether? You know, is this part of the discussion, and could this be an opening slightly counterintuitively that you know when we actually see a push towards new borders that Ireland might actually take this opportunity and uh, try to eliminate the borders altogether that do you do you have well absolutely I mean that point um, about the possibility of Irish unification was raised the day after the referendum result was known and unsurprisingly it was raised by uh, Sinn Féin the Republican Irish Republican um, uh, an Irish Nationalist Party in Northern Ireland. Um, and since that point, there have been many calls for a border poll. Um, and interesting uh, public opinion polls have taken place looking at whether there is a growing movement in popular opinion in Northern Ireland to have Irish unification. Because on the one hand, it does seem to be uh, a way of actually um, Yes, simply addressing the problem, just remove the problem, uh, take away the border. Um, I think there's there are, there's interesting discussions to be had about that, but actually, let's just um, look at it kind of um, in the in the round, um, and that is the fact that um, we see in the Brexit referendum um, how a binary question about borders um, and about sovereignty does not produce a situation in which you have um, a good p political environment for making um, difficult decisions that will have huge economic, social, cultural, legal consequences. Um, so uh, even if there was a majority in a border poll um, in Northern Ireland to have Irish unification, it certainly would not resolve the question or remove the problem. Um, and that is for the very simple fact that um, the whole reason why we had the agreement, the Good Friday Agreement to begin with, is that there are different community identities in Northern Ireland. And there's a very real um, and, and sort of substantive 
unionist British identity and, uh, and unionist community, and similarly there's a, a strong um, and real Irish nationalist and Irish identity. So the difficulty has been trying to manage those two and make them feel comfortable within Northern Ireland um, and, in, and support a peaceful environment. Um, and that is really still the objective of the UK and the EU in approaching all of this, that actually that's not to say a border wall won't, may not happen in the future, but for the time being, we know that um, there is no big movement to have, no, there's no clear majority for Irish unification or for that border wall to take place. We have to deal with the realities as they stand now, and that is that uh, Northern Ireland is a place of mixed identities. Um, and having an open Irish border and close relationship, very close relationship between Britain and Ireland has been vital to making both unionists and nationalists feel relatively happy within Northern Ireland and securing peace in Northern Ireland. Um, so although those discussions about border poll will continue to happen, we shouldn't view um, we shouldn't view Irish unification as a simple solution. Indeed, nothing seems to be simple uh, in, in those fronts. But let me let me just add: it's not by accident that Theresa May mentioned, you know, the the possibility of losing Scotland, for example. You know, the also Northern Ireland drifting away from the UK. You know, the the, the new borders have implications, in particular, on you know the UK as a as a unit. And there's a real threat that you know it will instill more claims for independence, you know, reignite Scottish nationalism. So we see this playing out politically quite forcefully. And uh, and indeed, the, in Ireland, you know, it is, you know, the Good Friday Accord is not so long ago, and some of those legacies of conflict are still very fresh. And I think there was a huge degree of consensus that these hard borders and the reignition of those conflicts shouldn't really be a result of the Brexit negotiations. How successful this will be, we'll see. Um, Emmanuel, to, to, to you, um, there's one question here that even asks you to expand the real cost of Brexit even more than, than what you've done already. You're, you've taken a very close look at the, uh, the likely costs of you know, re-establishing borders and the administrative costs, but you could expand this. And one, uh, the question here uh, asks you to think about the you know, fleeing you know, capital from the financial sectors, banks relocating, and there was, I think, a week or two ago, um, a longer article in the New York Times about the NHS, the health uh, system in, in, the, in Britain, and that it is increasingly difficult to recruit people, people leaving, nurses, uh, doctors, you know, uh, EU citizens leaving the island, and, you know, just the, the human resource impact. You know, you could put numbers to it, but it is clearly a broader social and economic challenge to have, in particular, if you have a no-deal Brexit, you know, with no citizenship, a clarity over citizenship status and so forth, so, you know, you know, in a way, this question that we have here asks you to even expand the real cost of um, a non, uh, uh, non-negotiated Brexit deal in particular. Yeah, maybe, I mean, one way to look at it is also to become aware of the fact that when I look at numbers, I look at very thin slices, right? And I look very much in depth and in detail. But I think, as Katie said earlier, we're, de we're dealing here with something extremely complex. And obviously, there are ripple effects across the economy. And um, I could add other thin slices looking at, and I see on the question points, is the cost of um, having just a disrupted economy. You know, the market today is an open market. Tomorrow, it's closed. Trade is going to be much more difficult. People talk about having, you know, if you reduce crossing by two minutes, you expand the waiting lines by, the estimates I've seen are scary, 12 to 18 miles on the UK side. Recently, the, the Calais port was um, estimating 30 kilometers. And so, you, you know, it's, it's not just that investors may not come to the UK and people may flee, it's also that trading is going to become very, very much disrupted. And so there are a number of slices that we could look at and very specific numbers and estimates. Uh, because we have, uh, we have uh, previous experience, for instance, I think in 2015, there was a strike on the French side of Calais that had a huge impact 
um, on the southern economy, but on the British economy, it was 32 days with disrupted traffic that caused something like um, 1.5 million pounds, so about 2 million Canadian dollars a day to the Kent economy only. And the overall figure for the rest of the UK is 250 million. So we see we have some in, we have some estimates as to what the impact will be, um, but we can't ever be sure, right? We can only go there. And yes, there are investors that are have frozen investments. They have investors that instead of investing in London, for instance, are investing elsewhere, both on the continent, but also in Ireland. Headquarters have uh, thought about moving. Um, I don't have the data as precisely as the talk I just gave, so I don't want to go too far there. But I know that some, the simply noting that the disruptions um, are, and the worries are enough to have a big impact on the economy, um, at least for a few years. Emmanuel, I, I greatly appreciate that you know, also pointing to the complexity of the issues at stake here. I think it is only daunting now to, to the major stakeholders in Britain what this means. And it, it goes into areas that we might have not even have thought about. You know, I've just, you know, at the moment I'm putting together a grant application to the European Union and we approached one of our British partners and said, are you sure you want us as partners? You know, what's going to happen <laughs> with Brexit? Are you sure you can still fund us, right? Yeah, so even in our own world, the academic world, things that, you know, we don't necessarily associate uh, with Brexit, you know, there will be real implications, in particular if it is an unregulated hard Brexit or no-deal Brexit. So these things are indeed, you know, they will have repercussions and you could put numbers and dollar or pound uh, to it, but I, I think the overall context will change very dramatically, that's for sure. We can't avoid talking about what's happening on the ground, right? Yeah, so the border issue is one, but you know, there's, clearly there's also some question about w what's happening at the moment, right? Yeah, so maybe, you know, since we have two specialists on the Brexit here, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to predict anything that's coming out of this process, you know, these days, but you know, what happened yesterday? What is the implication? Are we closer to a hard or a no deal Brexit at the moment? Or do we see, you know, does this vote that so clearly demonstrated there is no majority for the prime minister's deal open up new opportunities for soften maybe uh, the, the impact of Brexit and maybe move it closer to a customs union? Well, how do you see where the negotiations are? We're definitely running out of time. The Prime Minister even insisted we still want to do the March 29th deadline. Is there any sense of where the whole negotiations are going? Katie, do you have a sense? You're, you're close, at least geographically at the moment. Or I'm not sure that helps. Yes. I was in um, Westminster yesterday, actually, so it was interesting to be there and sort of pick up the febrile environment. Um, and I have to say, I, I had lots of meetings and interviews, but I came away sort of not the wiser, really, in terms of knowing what's going to happen next. Um, so, unfortunately, I think it really depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist as to your predictions for the future. Um, so, on the, let's say the pessimistic side or the sort of hard realism side, uh, Theresa May is quite right. There are only three options. Um, it's no deal, crash out of the EU, it's a withdrawal agreement, um, such as she's offering, or it's remain. Um, I don't, I don't see, um, remain being, um, much like, more likely than it, than it has been for a long time. I think it's, it's the, by far the most likely outcome is Brexit. Um, and uh, if the parliament isn't willing to support her withdrawal agreement, um, then we're looking at a no deal, essentially. Um, and it's quite clear that actually, from what the EU has been saying consistently, uh, the withdrawal agreement itself is not up for renegotiation. So if there's any amendment to the document that has been presented to the UK parliament, it is, comes in, the, in relation to the future, uh, the declaration on the future relationship. So the question about then if you look at it from a slightly more optimistic point of view, that is to say, well, maybe the UK Parliament will support the withdrawal agreement. 
um, how will you get how will they get to do that so it's either that they're face down by the no deal prospect um, or it's that you have some sort of uh, cross-party coalition to support a withdrawal agreement and the assumption in the sort of optimistic view is that the majority of MPs in Westminster are pro-remain or certainly pro-soft Brexit um, the most that we can hear from Labour Party is that they want a permanent customs union some want single market membership um, and so the question is how we get to that point um, we're not seeing anything at the moment from Theresa May suggesting that she is looking at a permanent customs union. We know that indeed that will only come in the political declaration anyway. Um, and as you mentioned, she's not looking at extending Article 50. Um, by law now, she has to come to the, Euro to the UK Parliament, to the House of Commons on Monday and issue a statement about Plan B. Um, and so unfortunately, we have to wait till Monday to see what that might entail. Will she stick to her red lines in, in what she was saying in the House of Commons today? It seemed to be that she would be. Um, so she's still saying, you know, um, no permanent customs union, uh, certainly no people's vote, no second referendum, etc. Will she stick to those or will she change her mind? Um, and it depends on how willing she is to look across to the Labour Party and try and um, gather support from them. Unfortunately, the relationship between the two leaders is... Um, pretty pretty dire um, and so uh, it, it's hard to see that coalition forming anytime soon. Thank you Katie for this assessment. Yeah, based on your uh, first hand account of what happened at Westminster. Emmanuel, I'm not sure you want to engage in looking into the future. There's another question here for you that might be the easier one, how the, what the EU can do to address the disruption caused by uh, uh, by a possible no deal Brexit. You know, I'm not sure where you want to come in here, Manu. Um, I see I see a question about disruptions, yes, indeed. Um, I don't think there will be disruptions within the EU per se. I mean in Brussels people are upset obviously. Uh, the few contacts I have in Brussels don't understand what's going on in the UK right now and you know these are people who are really well informed for some of them. Uh, and Katie just summarized to us what the out, you know, what the options are, mm -hmm. um, and it's bizarre. I mean, I just, it's my own view is that I find it extremely bizarre that the possibility of, you know, um, a proper clean Brexit would have to come across both sides of the, and then that the prime minister would have to go beg basically the other side to support her. Anyway, I find this kind of counterintuitive in UK politics, and I don't know UK politics very well, but it, if we bring where to bring this back to Canada, it has happened from time to time, but it's very rare that the whole political spectrum would have to basically look at individuals, members uh, of the parliament, and try to convince them one by one, and that party um, you know, discipline would basically be thrown away, because that's the way it would have to go. So I don't think there are disruptions on on the continent per se. There will be some serious issues with regard to trading with the UK that will affect some countries specifically, and I can name one that is worried about this and has been working on this. It's Denmark. Um, there, there will be some issues with traffic, and I think one of the slides that Katie showed was works extremely well as showing, you know, the road network, the transportation network um, is really going quite around, um, you know, quite far around the UK. So I think it's quite interesting to see that, um, you know, the, a lot of the, the goods are going across few points of entry, few uh, border ports, and that obviously on the continent, on that side, they will be uh, setbacks that will affect dearly the UK economy. Um, and uh, yes, I think that some of the uh, harbors that are, are preparing uh, for these eventualities, I, I know that there are reports on this to try to monitor, for instance, truck traffic and to try to monitor how far would truck be able to be uh, you know, stationary and wait for their turn to clear custom on both sides. Um, 
So, the, so I would say that you know, what this kind of impact is, are, however, not so dramatic. We've lived this in North America after 9/11 for a few weeks, um, and uh, the number one, um, uh, you know, the the economy was affected, but the number one sector that was affected by this was the automobile industry because it, it trades in real time across certain regions of Canada, US, um, in the in the Windsor Detroit region, in the Great Lake region, but otherwise it was handled quite efficiently across um, all you know 50 or so um, port of entries that we have on the border. I think in the case with the UK it's a many less ports of entry, and so these are going to turn into traffic jam nightmares for a few weeks. It's very likely. Yeah, no, we, we know about the, the preparation in the background, you know, the contingency plans of companies, the supply chain, you know, chains across Europe. I think they're hard at work in the background to prepare for the eventuality of a uh, hard Brexit or no deal Brexit. So um, I, I think that could be addressed, but I think the long term implications also for trade and uh, it will be probably heavier and more costly for the UK than for the rest of Europe. Some countries might be more effective than others. That, that's for sure. Um, should we wrap up our session today by two, again, more political questions? You know, one is that. Um, I'm also doing quite a bit of interviews here with the Canadian media. I'm often asked, you know, what about the second referendum, right? You know, why is it so difficult to, to launch this? What speaks against it? Isn't this a, the best way to uh, to address a highly contentious um, issue that seems to be going nowhere in Parliament? So, um, in particular, Katie, you know, if you follow this, you know, uh, there doesn't seem to be a champion in Parliament, but there is growing demand from other groups and the smaller parties uh, and the civil society groups for a second referendum. And the other uh, from Sean Eggleston is to think about the upcoming EU elections and you know, do we, or the uh, elections to the European Parliament uh, in May, do we see you know, the fallout, the political fallout of what's transpiring in the UK with the Brexit negotiations? Uh, will it embolden um, also right-wing populist groups, or will there be a sobering realization that the anti-EU rhetoric and stand um, has led the UK to the brink of uh, at least some economic calamity? So maybe we can uh, take this as our last um, question. Oh, no, sorry, there, and there's one more question that, that I don't want to miss as well, and maybe, uh, Emmanuel, you, you, you might want to take this, the impact of immigration. So we, you know, you have talked a lot about um, the mobility across borders of goods, services. Uh, what about uh, the human uh, flow, uh, so to speak, immigration issues? So these three things are on the table, and you know, uh, pick whatever you see um, most fit. To. Emmanuel, do you want to start us off, um, or uh, Katie? I'm not sure which order we should go. Whichever way. Okay, Emmanuel, okay, maybe you, well. you go, and then Katie um, has a last so word. Immigration was never a real issue for the UK. I know the campaign was won on mm -hmm. the idea that you know migrants were going to basically tidal wave into the United Kingdom. But when you look at the figures here again, and I have some data on this, asylum seekers seven to ten thousand a year. It's a trickle into the UK economy. It's always been handled very efficiently by UK services. Um, now, yes, there were people who were trying to enter the UK um, with, uh, you know, um, people settled um, on the, in the Calais region on the French side of uh, the channel. And um, it's quite interesting, however, to say that, you know, real migration into the UK comes from the rest of the EU, basically. So it's not the same mm -hmm. immigration question or the same immigration worry or the same kind of immigrants even um, that uh, are being discussed here, right? The migrants into the EU are not swamping into the UK and have never been. Uh, they go to other countries, actually. Most of them are really attracted by 
Scandinavian countries, but also Germany is the number one country uh, out of all of Europe, mm -hmm. both in terms of numbers, but in terms of proportion, I would say probably nine out of 10 would like to go either to Scandinavia or Germany rather than in the UK. So the issue is migration mm -hmm. from the rest of the European member states into the UK. And that's, a, that's a, an interesting question indeed because you have two categories. You have overall about 204 million people who come in and out of the UK uh, to visit or do business or go to school and so on and so forth, right? So we could call that flow in and out will be disrupted, obviously, um, from the rest of the from the rest of the world and and the and the and the uh, European Union. But more specifically, if we look at the two, and it's only two categories of people who enter the UK, it's the people who work there from the rest of the EU, people go there to work. And at one point people would say, you know, I have a Polish plumber or I have, but that's, these are people who can go in the UK to work. And the largest population actually is not those who work, but it's those who go to study. And that's, in a way, for me, that's because I'm a professor, obviously, it's very sad because the UK is a limelight of research and study. Um, universities are wonderful, and we all look up, and this will be obviously affected. Um, UK uh, universities are fairly expensive, but they are very attractive because they are such a limelight of research with uh, uh, traditions and so on and so forth. So here again, when we look at, you know, the big picture or the way the picture is uh, set in the media and we look back at the numbers, we get a very different sense of what the issues are. In my mind, is there was never an issue on immigration for the United Kingdom. And the UK disagrees with me, but the numbers are there. Thank you, Manuel. Katie, you have the last word. Yeah, there's still the issue or the question on the table about the second referendum, the popular vote. Uh, um, yeah. And, you know, please, you know, to take some time for any final reflection you want to share with us. Okay, I, I'm conscious that there's a question there about the referendum just to um, a border poll, just to say if Northern Ireland was to join the Republic of Ireland, then it would be done through a referendum in Northern Ireland and a referendum in the Republic of Ireland, and they both have to agree to it, just to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, and another point, just in relation to no deal, so it's interesting um, that, of course, Ireland is in a difficult position because it can't publicly be preparing for a no deal because it's so politically sensitive to do so, mm -hmm. uh, because it really does mean controlling the border, and that really is something that's anathema to the Irish government, um, any hardening of the border. And from the UK side, it too can't prepare quite so publicly for a no deal in the way that other EU member states can because the cost of it, and Emmanuel's pointed out quite how costly it would be to manage that, and, uh, the, and that hasn't been stated publicly. So to get onto the question of the second referendum, so yesterday, one thing you'll have noted um, is all the people outside uh, the House of Commons um, there to protest and make their views known. And there were pro-Remain, um, sort of anti-Brexit groups, um, which were in the majority, I think, and then um, pro-Leave uh, groups. And when the result came through that the withdrawal agreement had been defeated, um, both groups were cheering loudly um, because they were both pleased about that result. Um, which tells you something about the unusual dilemma in which we're in. Um, so public opinion polls at the moment would suggest, the most rigorous ones would suggest that basically the sort of two-fifths of the population are staunchly remain, two-fifths staunchly leave. And so you only have about 20% of the population who may, may or may not change their mind in relation to a second referendum. Uh, and it would suggest that maybe 50, it would be 54% to remain, 46% uh, to leave, more or less, at the moment. That may change um, as, as the clock ticks on. Um, I think that it, it would be, uh, I think Theresa May would do anything but go back to the people on it. She's been very clear on that 
although she has changed her mind on other things before. Um, but uh, I think there's general concern that uh, the country is so divided, um, actually, that that um, uh, to go now to the population and start this, this same old debate uh, wouldn't necessarily be something that would actually resolve many issues. And just one thing to note, I mean, I, I mentioned, we both mentioned um, sort of um, MEPs and Nigel Farage in particular in the issue of immigration. Um, behind all of that, behind the Leave campaign, um, and indeed the Remain campaign, was a fundamental lack of uh, information and knowledge about what the EU is <laughs> and the effects that membership has on day-to-day -day life and indeed on the legal environment, regulatory space, um, and on citizens' rights and on the economy as well. And it's remarkable to say so, but actually that uh, the levels of information and the levels of knowledge have not significantly increased um, since the June 16 referendum. So um, that would be one thing that would be <laughs> worth bearing in mind, actually. Would it be the case that a people's vote would be um, any less emotive and any more informed than the uh, the referendum the first time round? And uh, sadly, I doubt it. Yeah. No, Katie, thank you. That's a very important point. Maybe if people had watched our webinar, you know, things would have gone differently. But yeah. <laughs> but but that's you know, I think you still remember when you know the the Brexit vote happened. People googled what is the EU afterwards, right? Yeah. So it is you know the, the complexity of issues, the real implications that are put forth in a referendum. You know, a referendum is very hard to do justice to the complexity of the issues that are at hand, right? And that might be a sobering realization when we look back at the Brexit debate, right? You know, how can you come to an informed, democratic, and just uh, decision on these kind of issues? But let me thank you from the bottom of my heart for a very, uh, very nuanced and complex discussion of those issues. Uh, it's greatly appreciated that you took your time today. Um, and you know you can't hear and you know uh, hear the appreciation of our audience. They are silent on online. But uh, let me uh, thank you on behalf of the Center for Global Studies and you know the EU sponsoring this for this webinar. And I'm sure we're going to continue this discussion one form or another. You know we are not at the end of the drama uh, that Brexit Brexit poses. So we will continue thank this. You. Katie Emanuel, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver.